everything all right? Yes. Great. All right, well, we've got quite a bit to go over and I'm conscious that we're just in a period of very rapid change at the moment. So as I go through um, the things that you need to think about right now in terms of this sort of shutdown, uh, reopen and then possibly repeating, please feel free, as Cheryl said, to ask questions whenever you need to. Now, some of the things that I'll be talking about are actually from some fairly well-known processes around disaster management. And I think it just never really occurred to most of us that pandemic might be one of the disasters that we need to take into account because it doesn't really feel like one. But for many clubs, it's certainly going to be a challenge. So let, let me take you through... Um, um, I suppose initially I've mentioned this a couple of times before in um, how people behave in a disaster I think is important just to understand because you'll be managing, trying to manage people through this start up again. Some people freeze and I think how that looks in community is that some people just can't cope or they want to pretend that it's not happening. Um, there's um, other people that will just sail through these challenging times and, and just embrace it and work with it. And then that can um, raise other feelings. So that's what I'm saying is even the professionals are feeling that this is such an uncertain time and there's so many things to juggle that conflict might um, come up in your organisation. So I'm going to try and give you some really good places to go to, to find out dependable advice, because again, we're just hearing so much um, through social media and all sorts of um, challenges. So we're going to talk about um, recording how we went through the shutdown because we may have to do it again. Planning to restart, that's where we'll spend most of our time. So you're getting really up-to-date information. Um, and then getting ready in case you have to repeat it and what that might look like and trying to anticipate some things. Just bear with me as I take my squeaky toy off my dog. <laughs> so let's talk about the shutdown. You know, disaster preparedness is just all about being ready. And even though we are shut down now, I suspect one of the things that clubs haven't done is capture that information about what to, what to shut down and how to shut down. Now, how that... Um, looks in other kinds of disasters might be things like putting bricks on toilets so that they, so that in a flood, so that um, the damage isn't exacerbated. How it looks in pandemic might be that you actually can't get back into your club, even though there's physically nothing wrong with it, for weeks and weeks. And there's been all sorts of experiences there where food's gone off because fridges have broken down and no one's been into the building for six weeks, that kind of thing. Um, and there are certainly some phases of recovery that I'll talk you through. Where I want to focus, though, on, this, on the shutdown is really around documenting what you've already done. So um, knowing who you really key personnel are, what your backup arrangements might be for data, how you can get all your information if you can't get into the clubhouse. Um, uh, thinking about who can work from home, which we've already gone through. Uh, listing your critical equipment and whether that has to be maintained, whether some, somebody has to go and check on that stuff if no one's using your facility. Um, maybe finding another location to do some of what you do. And I'll explain as we go through in a little bit more depth how you're going to communicate with people when you can't go to the clubhouse. That can be really challenging if you've got a membership base that is not online. Um, uh, and then reviewing those things. So my best piece of advice for the shutdown is write it down now. If you don't do anything else from tonight, please just write a quick little list of everything that you did. Um, if you want to think about that in a bit more depth or go over it with your committee, if you don't have um, a lot of things to do immediately, think about what you did that went really well and then what you did that didn't go so well and come up with some things in writing now because when disaster's upon you, if you get hit by a second wave and you have to shut down immediately because someone in the club 
has been diagnosed, then you're not going to have time, even the time that we had this time to prepare. You may have to shut down your club that day. Um, so just be thinking about that preparedness with action lists, what you have to do, all those sorts of things. Part of ordinary disaster planning is having a go pack. And, and if you think in terms of a physical disaster, if there's a big storm coming at you, then you might want to grab a bag or grab a big plastic container and take it back to your place so that the club's assets are safe. COVID is going to have the same sort of response because it does depend. If you, for example, are in a building that you don't own, the builders might say, no, the building's closed. You're not allowed to go back in there. So you can't just assume that you'll always be allowed to uh, duck back in. So thinking about all of those things, what would happen to your stock and equipment, um, how do you manage all of that? Another really interesting one that's come up for community that I'm aware of is insurance. Um, because while, while some clubs have had insurance for the failure of fridges and freezers, if it's shut down due to a pandemic, some insurance companies are saying, well, we're not covering that because we don't cover pandemics, which isn't necessarily fair, but something to think about. Um, in this time of shutdown, how have you kept members updated? Have you done that well? Can you use uh, Facebook the way some clubs are? Do you have a website that you can use? If you don't have either of those things, um, you know, putting information up at a clubhouse is probably not going to be a good response in terms of um, shut down during this pandemic. So thinking about ways to communicate, even if it's a phone tree or something trite like that, where everybody has to call everybody else in the club or a few people in the club through a list. Is there anyone in the group that's um, done really super well in terms of shutdown or that, that has any strategies or things they'd like to share? If you uh, want to do that, you can type into the chat or if you um, don't want to do that or you want to send an email later on, we can share information that way. Sorry, Lisa, it's, it's Rachel. Yes. Um, I'm just letting everyone know that I, I, unfortunately, I can't see any chat. So I can see that I've got it to everyone and I can, you know, I've asked for everyone. So if anyone um, wants to, you know, ask a question, I, unfortunately, I can't see them. So I'm just wondering if it's, um, if you're happy with them, maybe hitting participant and the hand up or. Yeah, that's perfect. Or, or, or someone is asking, yes. yes. Rachel, Alison here, I can see them. So, okay. and everyone else can now see them. I can see that Joe's answered and Belinda's answered now. So it must be operating. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. I'll continue. And so can you see Tony's question? I can. Perfect. I now can. it's all good to go. It's just people hadn't pressed everybody. That's all. Right, right. Sorry, I should have probably mentioned that in the start. So do you want to, sorry, Lisa, there is one question there. If you want yeah, me to. Yeah, let's pretty, go. Pretty good question. Um, so Tony's not from a club, uh, but he's from a festival which had to postpone due to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I suppose it's more of a statement than a question in relation to a shutdown. Okay. Well, Tony, um, thank you for letting me know that, uh, that you're out there and listening. So I certainly feel your pain. Um, my organisations had to cancel, cancel big part of the seven events. One of them uh, was a big international conference that was due to be held in June that got rescheduled to November and now has been rescheduled to next June. So um, the, in terms of managing, um, I suppose, the postponement of events and the effects of that, that's just another challenge. And let's talk about that as we go through the restart because um, uh, I think one of the things that we did right there in our planning was that when we postponed, we discussed it with the venue where we were holding our event um, and we were able to secure three different dates for postponement. They were all tentative, but what that's given us is a little bit of flexibility because as you all know, we're just not sure um, whether international travel, for example, will be allowed even next June, let alone in November. So I think the, um, the more options that you can have, the more flexibility that you build in now to the restart, the better. 
And a lot of what I'll be talking about next isn't club specific. So I apologize if I, if I say club, I mean everybody, whether you're a club or an event manager or um, even just an individual or a business owner who's trying to work out what exactly is going on right now. All right. Well, let's talk about um, finding some trusted sources. So the federal government, obviously, and I should tell you, I'm going to send this presentation to council and all of the links that I have in it that I refer to, you'll be able to get the presentation and just click on the slide and go straight to the links. So if you do get stuck, you can just open this presentation and go straight there. And where I can, I've done links because the links are updated and the information I give you today is current today, but it might not be tomorrow. The links hopefully always will be. In the state government, there's some really good information on the health department's website. Workplace Health and Safety has got some information as well that I'll, sh that I'll share with you. Sports and Recreation, if you're a sport. Arts Queensland. So generally the way COVID recovery has rolled out is that the federal government has given the state government the responsibility for, I suppose, setting stage dates when they're ready to move from one stage to another. But then state government has devolved some of the responsibility in who can open when down to local government. So you also need to keep in touch with your council. Um, and of course, your parent bodies for sport and for other organisations, your parent bodies are going to be really important because for sport specific information, hopefully they'll be putting some thought into how you can roll out something that looks like a competition, particularly if you're a winter team sport who are going to really, I think, struggle to be able to offer a competition. So uh, again, I can see that there's some comments coming in, but as I'm sharing my screen, I can't see whether there's questions. So Cheryl, uh, Rachel, is there anything? We've had a couple of um, comments, uh, one from Mia in relation to adapting meetings to a digital platform. So at mm -hmm. this stage, we're sort of commenting back and forth to each other. And I suppose how everyone is in different situations in relation to this. Um, and another one was in relation to forums. Um, so yeah, I've just sort of, and, and again, boosting the staff has been an essential with more on-site importance and less volunteers. There is support on site. So we're sort of chatting back and forth and it's in relation to how each, I suppose, member here or participant is, is affected by it. Is so. experiencing it. Okay, exactly. That's, yeah. that's great. So yeah. I'll try and keep that in mind as I move through the presentation as well. So let's talk about, this is one of, I think, the most important websites for you to go. So this is Queensland Health. And I particularly want to um, bring your attention to the roadmap to easing restrictions. Hopefully most of you will have seen this document. Um, and it, it is a nice, clear um, assessment of where most organisations should be and where people are as well. So, of course, we're in stage one now. And so we're allowed to have gatherings of up to 10 people. Um, there are, and there's some really clear guidance here, but the, the intention in stage one is definitely that it's really all about unorganized activity. So, so yes, you can get together with a few friends, but this isn't about clubs or events or groups of people um, actively getting together to do things. So. Uh, everything that's being sent out at the moment is just around this is family and friends keeping active rather than beginning the business of community. Um, and then as we move into stage two, uh, we're allowed to have obviously more um, gatherings there. And then um, this is where sport, for example, might start to return some sports will be able to start to train, but certainly not all sports. And we're not really looking at a return to business as usual, still with limitations until the 10th of July. So, um, and I will talk about sports specific things later on, but it, no matter what you do, I think the important things to remember in each of the stages are the numbers you can gather. So 10, 20 and 100. Um, obviously the key dates, Social distancing will remain, um, and I'm going to talk you through how, how you can do some of that. 
and travel distances will change. The, the distances you're allowed to travel will change. Now, I also would encourage you to keep an eye on um, Work Cover Queensland, workplace health and safety um, laws and regulations. They actually do have a lot of really good advice for uh, all kinds of people and organisations about your obligations to your employees, your volunteers and your customers under this COVID reopen. And some of these things are highly complex. It just depends on what you're doing. Um, but they are at the moment sort of taking the, the um, tack that they want to help by providing information rather than get too serious. Um, but again, that's one of those websites that I would keep my eye on. And finally, Safe Work Australia does some great things in the volunteer community sort of space. So what they do is that they take the laws that are being developed and they put it into nice, simple, easy to understand language. And you can go to their website and go through these checklists that you can see here. Um, so you can say, I'm a club or I'm a small business or um, you know, the kind of thing that you're doing what your industry is, and then what you need information on in terms of COVID. And it takes you to some really good and simple instructive resources that say, well, you know, you need to... Um, so you can see down here, for example, how to clean and disinfect your workplace. Now, that's actually a really good guide for clubs, for anybody who's doing anything, if you own a business, how do you make sure that you're meeting your obligations in terms of cleaning and disinfecting? What does that even mean. Um, there's some great workplace checklists as well that you can use. And I also love the signage and posters that they've got on there. So I'll talk to you about signage, but there is some signage that you'll all need to have. This is one of the checklists that I um, wanted to share with you. So, um, and, and again, all of the links will have links straight through to these documents so you can see. But this checklist talks about cleaning, where do you have to clean, how many times do you have to clean, um, do you have to monitor people's symptoms, yes you do, uh, if they look symptomatic, do you have to question them, yes you do, uh, how do you plan ahead and all of those things. So great resources, if you want to know more I'll delve into a little bit when we get to the end. Um, and again, this is just the Queensland government giving you more information around cleaning and disinfection and um, waste removal and all of those sorts of things. What you should have as an organisation in terms of PPE, uh, the fact that you should be in, uh, encouraging your um, participants to download the app, all of those good things. But these are just much better websites to get information from than Facebook or um, from other people, which isn't necessarily reliable right now. Yeah, Lisa, sorry, I, I do yeah. have a question. And it's sure. it, and exactly what you just said, these links are, are probably you know, the best resources for you. So Diane is looking at stage three, just wanted to know are there are options available for semi-enclosed rooms as one person per four square metres uh, means very few participants. So, mm. and I suppose this is exactly what you sort of just said in relation to these links and right. everyday information. And, and, and it is a good question. So, I mean, the other thing I, I guess I would say that the, the intention of stage one is definitely outdoor. The, in, the intention of stage two is some indoor and outdoor, um, but very limited indoor. So when it comes to those restrictions, you know, you've got a small room and you normally do things indoor, there's no way around the one person per four square metres. So um, in, that might be a classic example of where you're, the space that you participate in has always been enough to do what you do, but in stage two, it's not going to be big enough. So, and it may not be big enough for the next year because um, it's very unlikely that even with the larger, you know, 100 people in a gathering, if they're inside, I suspect you're still going to be constrained by that four square metres. And so it may be in that situation, you need to try and find another space where you can fit 20 people with social distancing, even if it's just for the next few months. Interesting challenges, aren't they, everyone? 
Um, okay, so sports and recreation has uh, come out as well with some really good guidance. Um, but, but there's definitely frustrations even when you're looking at this sort of information because in attempting to clarify things, sometimes it gets a little bit complicated. But for those sports that are here, and even if you're not sport, there's some good information in this document, which is, they call it the return to play. And so it's a PDF document that really walks you through everything that you have to think of if you're a sport returning right now. It's got some really good general considerations that again, even if you're not sport, these are some great questions to be able to ask of yourself and your organisation. Um, you know, ha has your parent body got anything? Um, what's your monitoring level? Um, has your organisation encouraged participants um, to sign up for the app? <laughs> it's a little bit like a cult. <laughs> Have you clearly communicated adherence for all of your members? So that's through signage. Have you thought about policies? I mean, refund policies is another classic one that we'll talk about in um, a future workshop as well. And there's some great checklists there that anybody could use, whether they're sport or not. Here's some really nice advice from Sports and Rec on what those hygiene measures look like. Um, and these are the things that you should be talking to uh, your participants about. Stay at home. If you've got any symptoms, don't come here. Um, avoid shaking hands, touching each other basically and keep 1.5 metres away. And I know we think that everybody knows that, but I think we have, we've got an obligation for a start under workplace health and safety to remind participants about these rules. And then there's an easy breakdown of the stages and what they mean. So um, again, in stage two, still no contact. Contact sport won't be back until the 10th of July and who knows what that, that will look like. Finally, in terms of sports and rec, there's some really good information around facilities and your playing areas um, in that guide. Um, and just sort of thinking through your sport, helping you do some risk assessment for what a return to sport might look like for you. Um, and, and hoping that in the meantime, I suppose, that your sport will come up with some clear guidance. But what if they haven't? And uh, certainly the, the, one of the sports that I'm involved with hasn't provided any guidance for us whatsoever. What can you do? Uh, well, you go to all of the places that I just pointed out. You're going to have to use some common sense. Um, absolutely talk to your building owner because um, one of the challenges, for example, for netball is that if we talk about gathering, there's no clear guidance about what a gathering means. So in my netball association, we'll have about normally one and a half thousand people come to the netball courts over over every weekend. So clearly, we can't go back to sport the way we know it. But is a gathering 100 people on a court or two courts? Do we, can, we, can we play games on two courts and then have the courts in the middle empty and then do another court and say that's 100 people and that's 100 people? We really don't know. So probably the best advice there is to engage with council and ask them for some ideas about um, what your plan, your return plan might look like. That doesn't matter whether you're sport. It could be anybody who's in a council building. Um, consider waiting until there's clear guidance available. So ultimately, that was the decision that we came to uh, in my netball association. We just cannot move forward with any plans because we don't know what a season is going to look like and there's complications that you may not have anticipated. For example, uh, when you've got a lease for a building and you play outside under lights, you might think, oh, well, we'll just play three nights a week instead of one, but your lease won't allow you to do that. So there's all those sorts of really complex things you have to consider. Just because you'd like to do something doesn't mean you can. Um, and the best advice might be, well, we'll have to wait until we're sure. Um, and so, yes, not opening immediately is always an option and it might be an option that is easier for all of you. 
Now, otherwise, if you don't know, if you're looking for some sports specific information, the AIS has done um, this great document, which is all about their version of a return to sport. And they've broken down most of the sports and given some advice. They've um, um, categorized them as level A, B and C, but I've tried to match them up to stage one, two and three to get a bit of um, parity there. And you'll see, uh, you know, if we, if we look at netball, they're saying that in stage one, you can do a bit of training, um, but you can't go to the netball court, for example, and do that. You can just do that in a park somewhere. In stage two, um, you can do some passing and shooting and small group training. Um, but again, only if the, the owner of the courts will let you do that. And some of them might say no. And so no full training or competition for us until July. You then add in a further complication, which is, well, normally we might get one and a half thousand people, but we're half the way through our season. Does that mean that we are going to be able to have 500 people play or 200 people play or all of the 1500 play? We don't know. So um, the, the, again, that planning is all we can do right now. What else? do you do right now? Find out what you need to do to protect your members. So that's that workplace health and safety stuff, hand cleaning stations. How do you make sure people stay, you know, away from each other? Are you going to allow spectators, for example, or are you going to have a competition without spectators or an event um, without spectators? What signage should you have up? How many can you have if open? I'm going to talk you through that with my very basic math. <laughs> um, what modifications to participation might you, you need to make? So are there ways that you can reopen and have people not near each other or not in contact with each other? And then what happens if someone at the club tests positive? How do you find that out? Are you going to put an obligation on your members to tell you immediately because even though those processes do happen, they take some time. Does that mean, for example, that if you are having a competition and someone tests positive, nobody on the team can play? That certainly seems to be what some of the major sports are saying. You might have seen that on the news today. It doesn't matter if it's sport. What happens if someone who's been to your event tests positive? Do you have the processes to be able to find out who all of the people who were at the event at that time or might have come in contact with that person. So let's answer the easiest question first. How many people can you have in your venue? So again, I've got sort of inside your building. You can work it out simply by measuring the length of the building by the width, but that's if it's one big room or if your space in the building is one room. So that'll give you the amount of square meters and I've given you an example. Let's say we've only got one room and it's 10 meters by six meters, so it's 60 square meters. Each person has to have four square meters. So that means we can have 15 people in that room. Now that's very unlikely to change at least before the, till the end of the year, that, that rule of four square meters around someone. So uh, unless there's a breakthrough, a medical breakthrough. So again, this is about, can you continue to do something this year and what might that look like? Now, if you've got a venue that's got a few different rooms, you can measure the whole venue, but then you also have to measure each room and then control the numbers so that you know, in this example venue, you can have 22 people in there at one time once we're in stage three. In stage one and two, you can't. Um, in stage two, you could have a maximum of 10 in the whole building. In uh, stage three, you can have a maximum of 100, but you can only have 15 people in one room and seven in another. So even if the law allows you to have 100, your building doesn't allow you to have that many. So I hope that's clear enough for everyone to help you work out what that might look like. Um, and then you need some system of being able to count them in and out like you're a Bunnings. Um, what signage should you have? Uh, the number of people allowed is a really good thing to have as people walk into the room because they'll, they're getting used to policing themselves. Um, and hopefully people will leave 
I'm in a workplace at the moment where we can only have four people in the office space where I work. And people are generally pretty well trained now that they won't come in if there's already four people. Um, you should have some signs around those good hygiene practices, um, recognising symptoms and what to do if you're diagnosed, special conditions for each stage. So you might want to just print out some signs. We are stage one right now and this is what we need from our members or participants. Um, there are some good hand cleaning signs that you should be putting up in your toilets just to, and maybe in your canteen or food services to remind people about that. Um, and then any other special rules that you want to bring in. Don't forget that there's that funding available from Noosa Council to give you some support for some of these things. So, you know, if you're worried about how to put together a hand cleaning station, you don't have a sink and there's not the possibility of getting one in, maybe you can uh, talk to council about buying everything that you need so people can clean their hands in a hand cleaning station that doesn't involve plumbing. Take a little bit of time at the moment to look at your insurance as part of this restart because um, uh, insurance is one of those things that's proving quite problematic. Insurance companies are moving more and more to take any kind of compensation for pandemic out of renewing policies. So you might have it now, but it might get taken out when you renew. And not every insurance company is doing that, but keep an eye on it for sure. Um, otherwise, in terms of your volunteers, you know, if you've got a volunteer that gets sick when they're coming to volunteer for you because someone's been infected, what are the insurance implications of that? Are they gonna be covered? Under insurance, what if they get really sick? They probably won't be because most of this insurance doesn't cover, ironically, doesn't cover medical assistance. But again, be really clear about what your insurance does and doesn't cover. <clears throat> In terms of participant insurance, it's just, again, understanding and being clear with your participants that if they come to you and do something and become infected, they're probably not going to get insurance to cover their inability to work for a couple of weeks if they're a casual employee and that kind of thing. So exactly the same issues that come up under normal participant insurance. Okay, well, we'll talk just quickly about risk management because this restart is all about trying to cast your mind out into what it's going to look like as we restart and where it could all go wrong. Um, emergency treatment is just a classic one for me that I hadn't thought of uh, until I was doing this presentation. So we've got lots of really good first aid guides about um, what to do at our events or um, how to treat someone who might be in trouble. But I honestly don't know whether those need to change now because of COVID. So I'll need to talk to so, um, probably workplace health and safety and get some advice from some of the people in our club to work out whether we need to change some of those policies and procedures that we've got in place. You know, do they need special PPE if they're going to be giving first aid where a couple of months ago they wouldn't have worried, they just bandage a sprained ankle kind of thing. Um, there's new provisions coming in all the time. We talked a little bit about this a fortnight ago, but for me, um, one of the ones I wanted to bring to your attention is just blue cards. So for those of you that have anybody in your organisation that requires a blue card, you may have heard that last year the legislation was updated and they brought in a new rule that said you can't start volunteering until you have a blue card or you can't start working with children until you actually have that blue card. They just sent out notice excuse me, yesterday or the day before um, that said that they have now just put a hold on that. So um, that's now been delayed. So if you've applied for a blue card and you still don't have it, you can go ahead and start volunteering just right now. But do remember that's coming in in the future. Other rules and legislation haven't changed at all. So um, the Workplace Health and Safety Act requires us to look after our volunteers. And you can't get around that duty. Really doesn't matter whether you've got staff or not. There's some things that relate to all of us. Um, 
However, there's two different rules for not-for-profit. So if you've got staff, paid staff, and you also have volunteers, then your volunteers have to have exactly the same um, workplace health and safety training and support and reporting as your actual staff. If you're an organisation that doesn't employ anybody to do anything, you still have to make sure everyone's safe and there are those special COVID rules, um, but otherwise you're okay. Rachel, did we have a question there? I thought I saw something come up on the screen just then. No, I just um, just sent a little thing saying, you know, please feel free to ask any questions. So, And okay. just a reminder to make sure they share it with everyone so I can see it. But no, yeah. No Going problem. Through, very well. I'm <laughs> downloading a lot of information to you all, I know. And I, I know that it's going to be hard to absorb, but you can always go back and listen to this webinar again or have a look at the presentation and just think what are, what are just two or three things that I can do right now without feeling inundated and overwhelmed. One of the other parts of workplace health and safety that we always should have been doing anyway was what do we do on a normal day? We should be having checklists and it really doesn't matter. This one's set up for sport, but it could be anything that you do. It could be an event. So you should have little action lists where someone can go around and say, well, are there any sharps? Are the toilets clean? Are the canteen, is the canteen safe? Are the chemicals put away? You know, are there any trip hazards? All those sorts of things we normally do, but now we have to add some of that COVID stuff into that around, is the hand washing station set up and accessible, you know, to perhaps to small children? Um, is the um, end of day clean sweep, uh, sorry, deep clean um, being done? Has it been done? Is, how often is the disinfection done? Has that been done? Um, and outside your canteen, it just occurred to me when I was doing this, that if you do have a canteen or a shop or anything, um, as a not-for-profit, you probably have to step out that one and a half metres and put a little cross on the floor so that as people are lining up for the canteen, they're not too close. So getting the space ready, getting everything that you need and buying all of the stuff that you need so you don't run out. This is just narrowing down into that kind of checklist that I'm talking about. And again, this, this is just one from um, the Good Sports um, that, that basically says, what should you be looking at? How do you decide whether something is safe or not? If you can't get straight back in, to what you're doing, now's a good time to be reviewing all of these processes so you're ready to go as soon as you hit the stage that will allow you to start doing something. Uh, it's a good time in this restart to be thinking about relationships. So I've mentioned council already, it's not just because they're running this excellent series of webinars, but it's because they really are there to help and they might be able to find solutions for you. It certainly helps council to know if you're struggling or if you have special issues because they can often find solutions for you through their own networks. Um, remember that funding agencies, there's all sorts of funding coming out right now from all different sorts of places. They're trying to make that as easy as possible to um, access. So don't be, don't be um, scared of having to sit down and do you know, a, a funding application that might take you three days. These days, they tend to be, you know, a maximum of 10 questions, each one with a maximum of 100 words. And so long as you can get your point across, you've got a better chance of getting that money. Um, and just remember, most people want to help. So again, I'm happy to be a resource for you as well. You can always call council and they can contact me if there's something you think um, or you just need some help with, that's absolutely fine. I do want to um, just point out, we'll go through it in the financial workshop, but there's a really old not-for-profit kind of um, measure ab around disaster uh, preparedness. And it essentially says that to prepare for disaster, to, to um, um, be ready for what could go wrong, not-for-profit organisations should have two years of their normal expenses put away in a fund. And I think you can see, as, as we see what's going on in organisations, you can see the ones that have done that 
will make it through um, this year and possibly next year as all of this plays out. Whereas we're seeing now every day, even some larger not-for-profits and businesses that just don't have the financial um, um, buffer to be able to keep going. So for those of you that think, oh, we can't make a profit. Yes, you can. Um, we have to spend all of our money because it's members' money. That's a balance. It's also your responsibility to make sure you're financially viable into the future. And part of that might mean putting aside money. Now, it can get complicated because if you're not doing a competition or you're not holding an event or you haven't got people coming in and using power tools and things like that, your expenses will be reduced. But it, this is a good way to think about it. If COVID happened and we couldn't go back to the club for two years, would we have enough money to make it through? Or how much money would we need to make it through? And if you can start working on building up that buffer, that'll be another really good outcome. Sorry, Lisa, I've just, we did have a question. Um, mm -hmm. It's a really good one, actually. Diane just said, um, how do you get exemptions? Um, she's just saying Qantas has just sent out their plans for July. Social distancing is clearly not in line with four square metres per person on an aircraft. So that's, right. yep, yeah, good question. Um, and we'd probably have to look at that. <laughs> what do you, Lisa? <laughs> right, right. So it is a good question. You get an exemption through making an application to the Department of Health. And so what you have to do is engage with the health department and convince them that through good planning, you can deal with... Um, uh, managing a group of people or a gathering. Now, I, I completely understand some of these decisions seem bizarre to me, but I have not been privy to all of the planning, so I'm not sure. You know, I'm, I'm astonished that some professional sport is just able to get up and going, but I'm going to assume that they've really thought deeply about the consequences and how to manage them and they've been able to convince authorities. So you go to the Queensland Health Department and ask for an exemption, but you'd have to have um, some really good planning in place around that. Um, and that's essentially how tennis and golf, for example, were able to open a little bit earlier than all the rest. They're still not doing what they used to do in the way they used to do it, but they were able to convince the health department that they could control COVID. Was there another question just come through then, Rachel? No, um, Alison's actually just uh, put up the link to the health, um, so the health website. So there's the information on that link. And these links that we've got throughout the chat tonight, I'll include when I send out the um, link for this webinar. Great, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, so moving on, we, we talked a lot uh, in the last webinar about meetings and technology and all that kind of thing. So if you missed out on that, the recording's available. You can just go to council and ask to see that. And we talked in a bit more depth around how to hold meetings online and um, the intricacies of that and some clarity that's now come from the authorities. I do want to just remind all of you that are not for profit, and I understand not everybody on the webinar might be, but if you are not for profit, you should be registered with Connecting Up. It's Microsoft's charity, and as a not for profit organization, you can get huge discounts on software and hardware. All you have to do is register, it's really not that hard. You get on there, they'll ask you for a copy of your constitution and your certificate of incorporation, and then once all of that's ticked off, You'll, you'll get discounts depending on what you do. So if you're a child health related charity, you'll pay for hardly anything. Um, if you're an industry body like mine, you still get amazing discounts. And so um, they've also got a whole suite of things for remote working, some webinars around working from home and ensuring that the people who are doing work for you when they're absent are taking care of their own health, all those kinds of things. But aside from that, right now, if you wish that you could have given people laptops or iPads or something so that they could do what they need to do for the club at home, you can get those on Connecting Up as well. And they're usually only two or $300. They've been taken from large businesses, wiped clean, loaded up with the best new software and they get delivered to you. So. One of the best tips I can give you in getting more technology. 
So you might want to think about the difference between what you could do if you got two and a half thousand dollars from council um, and went and bought maybe one or two new laptops. You could probably get onto connecting up and get one for everybody at two or three hundred dollars. Another one of my favourite places to go is the um, Queensland Police Service. So um, that, that's something that I always check on as well, particularly when there's something happening around disasters. They've got very good advice and of course they've been tasked with keeping us all safe as we return from COVID. So another good source of information and actually hilarious. They do a great job of really engaging posts. Um, final, well, not finally, but I do want to talk to you as well about just um, recognising stress in each other, understanding that right now, I don't know if you've noticed, or maybe it's just me, but everybody's a little bit more snappy, a little less tolerant. And I think it's just the amount of information that's coming, the, the pressure on us to try and make decisions when this might not be what we do all the time. Um, and our fear of reopening, I think that that's a real thing. We expect that many of the people who we engage with may choose not to do anything with us this year because they're concerned about going out into the uh, community more than they need to. So who really knows what recovery is going to look like? Um, another piece of advice I haven't done a slide for is I think it's a great idea to email your members and ask them, you know, how many of them are, are coming back or how many of them are looking forward to the return to what you do or the, the hosting of your delayed event or whatever those things are. When you do um, talk to people at the moment, again, keep it really clear and simple, not too much information um, and don't communicate with them more than you absolutely have to. Um, and remember that you probably have to repeat that information over and over again at the moment. We always have to do that anyway, don't you? Do they ever really actually read the newsletter? Probably not. So, so um, but, but communicating now is a little bit more basic and you have to repeat and repeat. Um, if you want to get help from other people, ask clubs within your sport or your area of interest. Some of them might have some great ideas and some of the webinars I've been enjoying the most are not professional presenters. They're just people with the same areas of interest. So events is a classic one where there's just a whole lot of event managers doing all sorts of events from around the country that meet on Zoom and try and help each other find solutions to the challenges that they're going through. So those sorts of peer-to-peer -peer, um, information sharing things can be really good. If you can start to do that in your sport or, you know, if you're a men's shed or a garden club, you can start to talk to others and work out how a return might look for them and they might have some great ideas. Remember not to wait until you're really desperate to get help. Just reach out and ask. It's one of the only things that we can all do for each other right now. And of course, government's a great place to go. So in terms of the restart, what, what I would suggest is that you um, find out whether you're, I suppose the first question is, are you, are you doing your activities inside and outside, inside or outside? If you're inside, you're gonna to have to live with that four meter thing. So you'll have to define how many people you can have in the building. You'll have to do some planning and preparedness in your space, whatever that space is, and think about hygiene measures, signage, and just the, the ins and outs of how many people can be there. Um, certainly in stage one and two, so that's until the 10th of July, I think it would be safe to say that the, the best thing to advise your um, participants to do is to turn up, participate, and then leave. It's not about hanging around and having a chat. It's not about standing on sidelines or footpaths or outside in the car park. Um, it's about coming and doing what they need to do there and then heading off home. And that's particularly important because if you think about limiting numbers, maybe what you can do, instead of having 14 people in an hour long class, is to say to everybody, well, we're going to do 25 minute classes because we can only have seven people in the room. 
So we can at least do that and it'll be half the class that you normally get, but we're still doing 14 people in an hour. All those sorts of compromises are possible uh, and open your mind, I suppose. So let's go on to repeating. So wouldn't it be nice if we thought after the 10th of July, life will be rocky for a month or two, then we'll just go back to normal and it'll all be fine. I think we all know that that's uh, not likely unless there's some amazing medical breakthrough, let's hope. We are likely to move into waves and we're already seeing some examples of that, you know, with the Meatworks in Victoria and the McDonald's um, and then most recently the uh, transmission in Rockhampton. Um, so, so I'm absolutely positive that that will continue and what it might do is result in closures and that's what we mean by um, repeat. So hopefully by now you'll have time to do some um, checklists about how to shut down because if you do have to shut down again, you don't want to have to rediscover it. Remembering that you might never have to shut down again or you might have to shut down in six months and there'll be a new committee in place or, or a new volunteer in your role or a new staff member. So anything you write down now will be a real blessing. Um, and, and you also need to think about the possibility of having to shut down again in terms of how you structure things like alternative dates for events, um, in terms of uh, competition, for example, what really what happens? So if we normally all do something together in one day at the club um, and then that builds to a grand final, what happens if halfway through we have to shut down and a team can't participate for three weeks? Does that mean that they're just out? How's it all going to work? So you might get some guidance or you might have to come up with that sort of um, re restart during a wave or repeat during a wave over and over. Um, hopefully it will be easier to shut down if you have to do it again. You might only be subject to a local shutdown and you might need to think about that as well. Um, <clears throat> clubs with very high risk members have to do some special risk management. So by that, I would say any, any organisation or event or business that has seniors coming in or um, persons with a disability coming in are going to need to really think carefully about opening in COVID and then having to shut again in COVID and the risks and how you manage all of that. So um, that may all come down to, as I've said here, even, you know, it might, it might be business to business. It might be street by street. It might be that a whole suburb shuts down. We really don't know. You're not going to be able to anticipate anything, but put some thought into that as you're getting ready. Uh, Make sure that you don't flog dead horses. This is an old slide from a different presentation, but we, we all know that, you know, there's only ever a group, a, a group of a few who do most of the work. This is now additional work. So be really careful about not taking too much on yourself or not dumping all of this on someone else's shoulders. COVID recovery has to be a team effort, definitely. Um, support your volunteers so um, just remember that, that we all have lives so yes we're working hard as volunteers but we might also be stressed by work we might not be able to work because we've lost our job so there's lots of other things happening in our lives now more than ever so be supportive of each other um, and try and help people through use some really good practices in managing this so be a good project manager one of the things that i like to use is a gantt chart if you've never seen it before it's just a spreadsheet that helps you list all the things that you have to do by some due and and then add some due by dates just that sort of calm systematic approach okay well if 10 july is the date that we think we can open what do we have to have done before that happens Who's going to do it? When are they going to do it by? If you just keep it to that simple kind of level, you'll do much better than doing nothing at all or waiting until the week before and then panicking. So 
put some risk management on your yearly agenda anyway. It's one of the things that every club should do or every organisational business should do, but we never do. My event risk management plans are about two centimetres thick. So we, we even um, talk about what might happen if there's an earthquake or a tsunami or any of those things. Um, but yours might be a lot simpler than that. Um, ask people to, for some advice on what you could have done better and all that kind of thing. Prepare your go pack. Um, get ready to maybe not be in your space at a moment's notice and plan and write it all down. It's the biggest gift that you can give to your organisation right now. Well, I have covered, I know, a bunch of stuff. So I hope that I've given you just a bit of a guide in an hour. A lot of places to go to for some really good information. I think we might have a couple more questions now, Rachel. So Lisa, yeah, it was actually just um, Tony he had to go. So he just said, oh, okay. thank you so much. Great presentation. He looked forward to receiving the link when we get that done. <laughs> so. Thanks, thanks, Tony. And if you think about questions afterwards, just email the council. And if they can't um, answer it or it's something I talked about and they're not sure, they'll contact me and that's absolutely no problem. We don't want any of you to think, oh, they just gave me 20 more problems. We want to give you solutions as well. So the next workshop is managing money and laws. As things are changing all the time, how do you keep all those balls in the air? And this is going to be sort of right before we move from stage one to stage two. So a really good time to check in and make sure you haven't missed anything. So um, I hope that you've enjoyed tonight thank you for your patience i think we did really well you tonight did, yeah that was right. very informative thank you so much it was really good no problems all right everyone well good luck if you get stuck let us know otherwise i'll hand back to you now rachel yeah thank you so much lisa i'm going to um, you, lisa.